Well, my name is Travis Moore. I'm a second year PhD student in the Civil Society and Community Research Program. Um, my academic advisor is Lori Bakken. Some of you may know her. Um, I believe two of you do, at least. Um, and I've been an evaluator for uh, about five years now and uh, primarily uh, doing program evaluation in schools and school-based contexts, um, after-school programs. And then when I came to UW-Madison, I've been here for about a year and a half now, uh, going into two years, um, I started to evaluate what's known as collaborative initiatives, uh, collective impact initiatives, um, uh, community impact initiatives, things of that nature. Things that do not necessarily fit within the traditional program evaluation or program theory paradigm. So I'm going to give you um, this, the presentation lasts about 45 minutes as I practiced, um, and uh, if I go very quickly, so I'm just going to go very quickly. And if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand throughout the presentation. Um, I'd rather not wait till the end. So just a brief overview. I'm going to talk, I'm going to define what my title even means because it's wrapped up in academic jargon. Um, then I'm going to discuss the limitations of program evaluation, then go into new approaches in evaluation that build off of some of the successes, but also arise because of the limitations of, of traditional program evaluation. Um, then I'm going to talk about complex systems and systems theory, um, equity uh, and social justice, and uh, then go into an example of applying concepts uh, like complex systems in practice. And then uh, discuss uh, or remind you if you want any of the resources like these slides. I also have a literature review um, discussing some of this stuff, and I can send you that. Uh, just give me your email, and I can do that after the presentation. So uh, quickly defining um, what this uh, title even means. Cl complex systems practice and the evaluation of collaborative initiatives. Complex systems is, is actually quite simple. The, 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 de the definition is, at least. Um, it features a large number of interacting components um, that when in interacting with one another do not um, project a linear uh, dynamic. And so that means that the summations of their activity within, th within these uh, um, components do not always equal the whole. And so you have a lot of parts that are interacting with one another. They don't always uh, equal the whole. Um, praxis is, to me, there's a lot of definitions for praxis. Uh, for me, it's the, the where theory and practice meets in the middle. And so it's the embodiment of, of theory, but then also uh, how you practice it in your vocation. Um, evaluation, as we all know. Oh, who, who here identifies an as an evaluator, by the way? Anyone? Me? Just me. As an evaluator. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> um, so evaluation is really a subject uh, going, or the evaluator going into, let's like, say, a program process um, and determining its worth, merit, or value. Um, today, we 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 no longer consider the subject to be the evaluator to be an expert. Um, they have uh, a range of skills that they can work with in, in collaborative initiatives, um, but we now consider them co-collaborators instead of the um, objective um, expert. Uh, collaborative initiatives is really simple. It's just a group of people working together to solve complex social issues. Um, so I'm going to jump right into the limitations of program theory. It's important for me to explain this primarily because um, it explains my personal process, my personal professional uh, process um, in the past five years, um, uh, and moving away from program theory. So if you think of program evaluation as um, in collaboration with the positivist paradigm, you have uh, the fact that there is objective truth and that truth is just observable. And you also have laws that give rise to the, the fact that truth can be understood through cause and effect. So it's a very linear way of thinking. Um, program evaluation under this sort of paradigm, um, it means that the evaluator primarily tries to determine program efficiency, um, effectiveness, and again, it's based on um, impacts and determining outcomes of a specific program or process. Um, and the overlap here is that it just seeks to uncover, you know, this objective truth um, 
and in programs and interventions. And I apologize for like the the um, writing being kind of odd. This wasn't the case whenever I made it, but. Um, so what happens when you interject collaborative initiatives? Well, it becomes um, obsolete in a sense. Uh, what happens is that you still have positivism and program evaluation overlapping one another, and you can still use that in, in, in a sense. Well, you also have program evaluation in the evaluation of collaborative initiatives. The overlap there is that it, there's a question mark because it's still useful it just has a lot of limitations to it. And so you can still use it to help you determine outcomes, to help you determine impact, but you have to also understand that it is inflexible and it doesn't help you in terms of understanding an organization's development as well as other approaches. when you're collaborating with people who are developing programs when they might jump from 3.2 back to 2.5 and change. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Um, so it also means that you can use logic models, it's just limiting. Yeah. Um, it's not so much that we have to like throw them away because they're still useful in a sense and, and everyone likes to map things out in a linear fashion. And that still exists within new approaches to evaluation. Um, it's just the idea that it's, it limits you to go a certain route when collaborative initiatives are changing all the time. And you need to have um, uh, evaluation practices that change with it. And logic models don't necessarily do that. Um, and I also also mentioned that uh, oper when you when you're evaluating a collaborative initiative, operating under a positivist paradigm is just it just doesn't work. Um, primarily because there is uh, no objective truth in a collaborative initiative; it's an, it's co-constructed, and so this is a constructivist uh, paradigm that we operate under in these types of evaluations. Um, so I'm not saying that program evaluation is useless. I am saying that it has a few limitations. Um, some of the, the pros uh, of using program evaluation and, and the evaluation of uh, collaborative initiatives can be conceptualized as helping them to, to design their logic model so you can still use them um, and provide guidance for their theory of change. Um, that's really important, I think, um, especially in the development of, of an organization. Uh, outcomes, uh, if, since we're all mostly cons um, concerned about funders, uh, pro program evaluation um, uh, I think is a good route uh, because funders generally are very concerned about outcomes. They're very concerned about numbers. A program evaluation is traditionally um, quantitative and so it appeases uh, a lot of funders and the, and the framework they work under. Um, and again, uh, program evaluation is about causality. It's about linking um, cause and effect to, let's say, collaborative initiative processes to the outcomes that they want to achieve. Um, but again, so the cons, um, and there are a lot more of them, the purpose, target, and methods are entirely obs obsolete. Um, and the role of, of the evaluator is not to be the objective expert that goes into uh, these groups and to offer and bestow their knowledge. <laughs> it is more of a, a co-constructive of uh, co-construction of knowledge um, and the development of an organization. So um, this has been my experience whenever I've gone into collaboratives using a program evaluation framework. Um, and they generally look at you like you're kind of insane and, and you don't know what you're doing. And it's true because uh, collaboratives just, they don't work that way. They don't function and they don't stay the same over a year period of time or even a week. Um, and so there have been new evaluation approaches that have developed in the past, I would say about two decades to, to address um, the challenges uh, that uh, collaborative uh, collaborative initiatives um, kind of present to evaluators. And that's community impacts, um, assessing systems changes, uh, networks and collaborations, leadership, um, inclusiveness, um, diversity, collective impact. Um, and all what all these have in common is that program evaluation cannot uh, get to the heart of relationships and why relationships are important. 
um, whether between people or between people in their environment, uh, between people and policies. And so uh, newer approaches have been developed, like Margaret Hargrave's planning guide for evaluation, evaluating systems change. This is an, exact, uh, an excellent primer to get started in this type of work. Uh, you also have Michael Quinn Patton's developmental evaluation and principles-focused evaluation. Uh, this is an entire field within evaluation now where uh, Patton takes complex systems concepts and integrates it into evaluation practice. His 2011 book um, uh, called Complex Systems, actually it's called Developmental Evaluation, and it uses complex systems. However, the gap is that um, while there are, while he uses concepts and provides examples, it doesn't really give you a framework through which to um, apply the concepts he, he gives you. Um, so I think the field is working on that right now. Principles focused evaluation is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's a focus on, on the values and principles of an organization to guide their development. The Kellogg Foundation Systems Oriented Framework um, is not as good as the, the previous two, I think. Um, it, it, it lacks examples, and, um, but it still it is very similar to Margaret Hargrave's planning guide in the sense that it gives you a rundown of what complex systems is, gives you some definitions, and uh, a little bit of a, a framework to um, employing um, that in your practice. So what they all have in common, though, is the fact that uh, uh, these planning guides and frameworks are trying to understand uh, groups of people and their actions um, to change mostly systems um, in addition to policies and environments. And so the, the phrase policy systems and environments actually comes from public health. It's called PSC change for short. Um, so I'm just going to keep saying that instead of the whole thing now. Um, and uh, now I'm going to go into what complex systems actually is. Um, um, so it's for me, it's helpful to break it up into two sections. One is complex systems uh, structure helps you understand structure of a system, and also helps you understand dynamics. And so first, I'm going to go into the structure and the concepts that help you understand structure. And so complex systems is a science of understanding relationships at its heart. Um, and it's, it really is as simple as that. So we don't need to make complex systems complex, if that makes sense. Um, part of the system, uh, or understanding a structure, is about understanding the components. So each part of the system, that can be, components could be people, it could be um, policies, it could be um, various elements that are connected to people, uh, whether that's in the environment, um, so once you understand the, the various parts of the system, you also understand or need to understand the relationships that form because they are a part of the system um, and the interrelationships. So a good one is social network analysis. There's a lot of people connected to other people. Um, and because we're trying to understand a specific type of system, you have to put boundaries around it. And that's really important in evaluation because you can't evaluate everything. Um, so putting boundaries around it is, is, I think, probably one of the most important steps to understanding the structure of, of a system. So again, uh, parts, relationships, and then putting boundaries around that. Um, now I'm going to give you an example, uh, which is a, it's a super easy example. So a tree. If you think of a tree within its context, its forest, um, that's not a system. That's simply a tree within context. And the context is not a system. So instead, you have to think of more components, so a tree, the soil, the landscape, the air, and more importantly, the global exchange process that happens between all these components. Those are the dynamics that construct how the system moves and how it breathes. So the other part are dynamics. So we just cover structure. Dynamics uh, is um, also somewhat simple to understand. Uh, one. The first dynamic is natural disasters or random un unorganized uh, dynamics. Um, an example of that is hurricanes. Um, another one could be like my driving. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, that's a terrible example. So, and then you have simple organized um, uh, sys uh, dynamic, system dynamics, uh, which is the traditional bench science laboratory um, uh, experiments. Uh, they're controlled, they're static, they're mechanistic. Um, then you have complicated, which is a really interesting distinction um, to understanding complex systems. So you have complicated systems. Hey, 
and complex systems. Complicated is like an orchestra. So you have defined parts within um, the orchestra that kind of um, in summation give you a whole and gives you harmony. And so it's understandable. Um, that's a complicated system. Complex system is a lot of interrelationships. It's a collaborative initiative um, that gives rise to not necessarily uh, predictable outcomes, but unpredictable outcomes at any given time. Um, they're adaptive, and that comes from complex adaptive systems in biology. They're also uh, co-created, and so the outcomes that you see in cl collaborative initiatives are, also, are often uh, co-creations of people working in tandem to one another. So um, I'm going to jump right into like how do you even measure this stuff, and this kind of gets into what we were talking about earlier. Um, if you cannot do mixed methods, which is the um, I would say is the 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 way the route to go in determining what uh, or measuring complex systems or the systems change, then I would say you start with qualitative methods. It's I think is the best way of of kind of. Um, unearthing the rich data that can be found in, let's say, an organization or the organization's um, systems change processes. Um, and that could be anything from focus groups, mapping exercises. Mapping exercises gets to like um, causal loop diagramming, um, outcome mapping, things of that nature, that you can sit down with your collaborative and, and map some of the outcomes and how they came to be. Um, Quantitative methods, of course, are, are, are um, structured interviews, they're surveys, um, multi multiple choice surveys, network surveys that ask about network structure and who you're connected to, let's say in a social network analysis. Um, and of course, mixed methods is really the way to go. Uh, it's it's a, obviously the, a combination of both quantitative and qualitative methods. It is not picking and choosing which methods you want to choose from a quantitative uh, method. It is using holistically quantitative methods and qualitative methods in your approach to kind of discovering um, your system and creating knowledge about that system. So analyses, uh, I've, I've chosen analyses that are primarily uh, mixed, uh, are, are can be conceptualized under the mixed methods approach. Um, there's causal loop diagramming, which provides a language for articulating or understanding dynamic and interconnected situations. Um, I'll be going over a little bit uh, more um, causal loop diagrams in a second for my example. Um, there's also social network analysis, which can be both qualitative and quantitative. Um, there's outcome mapping. Uh, process monitoring, and something new to me is strategic assumption surfacing, which is this really convoluted uh, phrase for, for talking about how um, you can unearth biases that are somewhat concealed within a collaborative, and uh, uh, which I think harkens back to like equity and, and promoting equity. Yeah? I don't want to slow you down, but mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share these slides with us, because my notes are getting really screwed. Yeah, so that is what um, I'm Does hoping... I, so, so if you provide your email, yeah, I will be sending these slides to anyone who provides their email. Um, and then there's agent-based modeling, which is right now the kind of the avant-garde of, of the field, which is model, modeling cumulative effects of individual agents complying with sets of simple behavioral rules. And what that means is that when you have a collaborative initiative that you've been working with for a while, you start to understand that they're operating under a set of rules, and you can actually model or simulate their change over time and actually simulate how they achieve specific outcomes. So. Um, so what is even, what's the point of, of doing these sorts of analyses or even using complex systems uh, concepts in your evaluation? Well, one, it helps a collaborative understand and, and further the, their development in the team. And a lot of, them, a lot of these uh, have to do with that, that kind of concept. Um, it also helps track progress toward a desired outcome that is usually a part of systems change processes. Um, uh, it also helps align evaluation activities with collaborative initiatives practices. Um, uh, in a timely manner, and that's important because uh, these types of initiatives, uh, because they're so quickly, they, quick, they quickly change, uh, you need to have evaluation practices that are able to measure very quickly also. So the uh, evaluation practice needs to align with the nature of the collaborative that you are um, measuring. And if they don't change, let's say, and by change I mean let's say um, they decide to um, 
measure changes in policy systems and environments. Um, and that's something new that didn't exist about a month ago. Uh, your evaluation, let's say your logic model, if you're using a logic model, wouldn't really necessarily account for that change. Instead, you would use um, the concept systems approach uh, that is iterative and adaptable to the nature of what you're measuring. Um, it also helps in the development of collaborative initiatives. Um, both the organization itself, so the group of people who are doing the things, and then also the things that are being done, which is the intervention, the program, um, if they have any. Uh, for example, my the example I'm going to be going over, doesn't, they don't really have any programs. So what I'm really measuring is the, the collaborative itself. Um, and so I'm going to mention really quickly, um, I love that it says AMP, for like ampersand. Yeah. It's really annoying. Um, so. Equity and social justice, and this is not a sidebar, this is really important to understand, is that uh, equity and social justice as concepts fit really, really nicely into this uh, sort of approach. Primarily because if a collaborative initiative is shifting to measure changes in equity, what they're really doing is, is shifting to measure changes, changes in systems. Um, and that can be, again, PSE changes as well. Um, and so simply incorporating equity questions into, let's say, a network survey is really easy. And here are some examples. Um, uh, this is a specific type of, uh, of equity measurement. It's an organizational one and a health equity one as well. So uh, one example is our organization includes staff members and board advisories that reflect the diversity of our community. And I'm not going to read the rest because of time. Um, so before I move on, there's like a lot of concepts I've talked about. Are there any questions before I move into my example? Yeah. Maybe this is a question. Um, but, Alrighty. Um, I would imagine that you might get some pushback by the talking to folks. Can you talk a little bit more about how like, this paradigm handles with those critiques? Yeah, so I don't. Like people, you know, um, like when we, I even think of some of the things that we're, like our, our seminars might be asked to provide to people like methods or something. That's which right. Which is one way of looking at something that when you're talking about so much more. Yeah, yeah, so um, uh, this approach does not neglect numbers and it does not neglect the, the idea that funders need to see change. Um, in fact, this, is, this approach is, was developed in order to satisfy people who needed to see change and development over time for initiatives that were not being measured uh, correctly or in a very rich way. And so it's, it's not to say that um, positivism is going to have a problem with this approach. It's just that it's building off of it to provide more flexibility for evaluators to do their job and to provide information to, let's say, funders um, or um, and to go back, go back to your question, it's like, is it, do you think positivists would have a problem with this? Well, absolutely, but that's not the point. Collaborators don't care about that, um, and uh, and maybe academics do. And and I would love to have conversations with people um, who are traditional bench scientists and to discuss how um, these kind of concepts fit into their to their work. Because this is actually these concepts came from their work. This comes from physics. It comes from biology. It comes from chemistry. Um, and so I would, uh, I'd be really happy to, I mean, obviously you can see I'm like really happy about doing that, <laughs> but, uh, um, does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, now I'm going to provide you an example. Um, oh, great. Um, so I'm working with a group called Health Tide, and, and some of you may have, have heard of this group here on campus. So it's a group of about 10 people here on campus and over in Wharf in the School of uh, Public Health and Medicine. Um, they are a network of statewide and place-based community partnerships that uh, work to connect, align, and unite multi-sector um, partners across, across Wisconsin in the name of, of health promotion. And so they, they really try to create these partnerships in a way that decreases health disparities, um, but also gives um, uh, community members across Wisconsin um, equal opportunity uh, to thrive. And so I am not sure why my PDFs are not showing up on the right, but right here would be uh, the 
uh, breakdown of the teams within Health Tide. So there are there are a couple teams. An example is um, schools team that works primarily to promote health in schools across Wisconsin. Um, another one is active living. Um, uh, another one's uh, healthy eating. So, so the the organization itself has uh, you know teams of like one or two people to address a specific area within health promotion, um, but it's. It's good, it's helpful, I think, to conceptualize Health Tide as both staff, so here on campus, but also as a network of health promotion partners across Wisconsin. And so um, I believe right now their partners are, are a little over 3,000. And so you can imagine that this is a very extensive network. And by partners, I mean these are people working at other organizations promoting health, ne not necessarily community members. And so the 3,000 partners, you, you might imagine, reach a lot of community members. Um, so the evaluation of Health Tide has actually been going on for about five years. Um, I came in about s seven months ago um, to an evaluation that primarily used um, uh, uh, traditional program theory and program evaluation in, in evaluating um, Health Tide. Health Tide itself is actually part of a larger uh, project um, that I'm not going to get into because it would get way too complex. It's part of a larger pro project here on campus um, that it was originally um, conceived as a collective impact project. Um, and so the evaluation five years ago took that approach to measure it, a collective impact approach. And so it measured thing, the core conditions of change um, under the collective impact framework. And why that was limiting is because that's not what they were actually doing. Um, they were instead um, convening partners across the, st across the state of Wisconsin, connecting people. Um, and through those connections, hopefully causing um, uh, people to uh, form their own projects, um, form their own interventions, and then create systems change through those uh, connections that were formed as a result of Health Tide being a part of, of um, health promotion. And so what we've shifted now towards is more of what, the, what does the network actually look like? So what is its structure? Um, and that way, when we know who's a part of it and we put boundaries around that, we can also say who's not a part of it. And that gets back to equity. So if, if, if let's say, if we map um, uh, race and ethnicity and SES onto our understanding of what the network looks like and who it doesn't include, then we can understand who, who next we need to start to talk to um, as a network and who we need to collaborate with. We're also asking, how does the network function? So this gets to the dynamics aspect. Um, and eventually, this is a very broad question, um, so it's not one I'm really working with. It's, it's really downstream. It's, do health type practices achieve changes in, uh, in policy systems and environments? And so that's, that's really a, a impact and outcome um, a question that we're trying to move ourselves toward, um, but that we are not near quite yet. And so I'm going to skip over the timeline. Um, it's just important to know that uh, our shift has been away from program evaluation because of its rigidity. Um, we have now shifted into, of course, um, un trying to understand the system. Um, and the system here would be conceived as, as being um, the health tight staff, but also the, its partners. And so really this is a social system, right? Um, we are also conceiving the system as uh, interacting with various community members who play a role in um, creating um, uh, the, the current conditions that we're working to change. Um, so as we move into this year, um, well, I guess we've already moved into it, it's already been a month, but um, we're working to understand um, of course, again, the structure, we're doing causal loop diagramming to get from understanding structure to understanding the impacts of, of the network. Um, we're also trying to measure PSE change. So what I'm currently doing with Helltide kind of looks like this. Um, Right now, you have complex systems expertise, which I'm, I'm working with uh, Brookings and, and Tufts to create a survey that gives you the specific data you need to understand the structure of a network and of the system and the dynamics. And so that's why you see um, Tufts and Brookings here. 
Um, and the overlap with the health tide network, of course, is all about understanding the network structure and the dynamics, again. Um, health tide networks so the staff mainly, working with partners uh, who have knowledge and, and, and perform certain activities within their communities. Um, that overlap is about building relationships and partnerships. And we want to measure that with evaluation as well. And the overlap between complex systems expertise and partner knowledge and activities is all about uh, policy systems and environmental changes. And so in the very middle, you have a collaborative initiative evaluation where you're utilizing network analysis, network evaluation. Um, you're utilizing your understanding of theory of change within the organization, um, the principles they're using to guide their development. Um, you're also utilizing your, your understanding of what partners are doing to create systems changes and policies and environments. Um, and you're also utilizing um, something like this. And so this looks complex, and you're not meant to be able to read it. It's blurry. Um, uh, because it's stolen. <laughs> it's stolen from uh, Shape Up Somerville, which I'm sure some of you have heard of, um, which was a, a, a success in many ways and also gave researchers a lot of uh, gaps to fill. Um, but this is meant to show you that this is a causal loop diagram. And the only thing to take away from this is, is that uh, this is what I'm building for right now with Health Tide. And the point is that each arrow represents either a positive feedback loop or a negative feedback loop. And that means that whenever you find a positive feedback loop, like something that you you want to uh, keep going, in the sense that let's say you you have a school and you've increased access to healthy food, and you want and that's a positive feedback loop, um, and kids are keep they keep eating it, um, you want to have then a a intervention that kind of um, keeps that going. You want to have uh, you want to shape your implementation processes. Uh, within Health Tide to kind of like capitalize off of off of that positive feedback loop, and of course you have negative feedback loops that you kind of want to remove, and so you can kind of use this to measure uh, changes over time, and and more specifically and importantly connect the um, collaborative initiatives actions or activities to their impacts and their outcomes. Um, so, but why are we even doing this? So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide because um, it's kind of summarizes everything I'm doing. Um, we're linking, or I'm linking uh, the health tide uh, activities to health tide outcomes. And the way I'm doing this is by taking an existing outcome. So I'm going into health tide, even actually today, um, I'm asking for a specific team to tell me something they've noticed. Um, in the past um, year or two years that's been a significant achievement for them. Um, and so we're going to identify that as an outcome. And then we're going to work backward and map um, how they achieved that, and more specifically, how Health Tide played a, a vital and crucial role in facilitating um, that outcome that was achieved. Um, so eventually, we also want to say something about um, why they were vital. And so since Health Tide is a network, and it consists of social ties, we want to say what kinds of social ties were important to facilitate movement from, let's say, creating partnerships to achieving um, a certain outcome. And so right now, my idea is that they have built a lot of social capital, and they are now using that social capital without, throughout um, Wisconsin to facilitate par partnerships that end up having specific outcomes in communities in northern Wisconsin, rural Wisconsin, let's say. Um, so I'm using, I'm, mer I'm merging outcome mapping for that, and that's what I just explained, and outcome harvesting, uh, group modeling, and network analysis uh, to kind of get at that. I'm also uh, uh, helping Health Tide develop as an organization, as a, as a team of people who do sorts of like convenings across um, across the year. This uh, requires process mapping, so it's really just kind of like a, a process evaluation of like what, yes? So um, you talked before about um, you know, the benefits of mixed methods, which I, I agree with you yes. on that. And um, then you've got one survey that you're using. Um, you know, typically survey responses can be really low. Response yes, rate. absolutely. And also, um, when you try to, for us working with the community partners that we generally interact with, yeah. when we try to have focus groups and interviews, we have to think about compensating people for their time. That's right. Does Health Tide or the Evaluator Network have a way 
or, or are your partners motivated to fill stuff out and meet with you because they're already able to pay to work a job that has the same interest there? No. So no to that to that second part. They don't have um, uh, any. Uh, in terms of like working with us already, they don't have they don't have that aspect. What they do have is incentives. So we provide free registration to a conference that they an annual conference that they put on if they um, in, a, in a raffle to fill out the survey. That's one thing. Um, we also, uh, from my understanding, th they have really really good partnerships with these people um, across the state, and the partners want to fill out the survey. It's we've now split it up into two because it's so long, it was like 90 questions, which is absurd. Um, so we've tried to shorten it, I'm shortening it right now, um, and, and we're splitting it up. So it's another way of increasing sample size. Um, so yes, quantitative, but uh, we're also doing, the qualitative part is group modeling, and, it's, it, and it also increases like the participatory aspect of evaluation. We're going into uh, asking community partners and community members how they've been a, played a role in um, uh, achieving a specific outcome, whatever that might be, um, and how that relates back to health tide. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, so when you get together with team members in person, yeah. are you able to give them any kind of service? Yes, yeah. Um, it depends, it changes. Um, usually, uh, the partners have a good relationship with community members, and so they are the ones who kind of facilitate that process, and so health tide doesn't need to be um, and incentive, provide an incentive structure for that. Um, but I, they do have the money to do that if they needed to, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, so uh, to help Health Tide uh, develop, I'm doing process mapping, of course. Um, and then I'm also helping uh, Health Tide uh, understand what their network structure looks like. And this has a lot to do with the net network analysis and using the, um, the survey, the, the um, a survey that goes out every two years, um, because it is so long, um, to understand and ask questions about who they know, um, who their partner knows, and so that we can begin to visualize what the network looks like. Um, and then why I'm doing this is to is for both development and change over time. Um, so I believe these methods and analyses uh, will actually, they really will help Helltide understand what they do, who they are, and how they provide um, um, uh, certain mechanisms to their partners to facilitate uh, both their partner's job, but um, systems changes. Um, and then, so I want to back up a little bit and talk about like my own research. So this is all my my practical work, right? Um, my research on evaluation has to do with uh, several questions. One, I'm asking, can we use complex system methods to increase deep resonant engagement? in evaluation practice. And so this gets back to participatory evaluation. Um, I would like to think that using complex systems, concepts, and methods, and analyses uh, can be a really great way of, of um, interacting with community members in a collaborative process that, that is also one that um, creates enough knowledge around, let's say, health ties practices that can be valuable for health tie, but also valuable for community members. Um, kind of leverage their knowledge, also highlight or um, lift them up as well um, and empower them. I'm also asking, uh, can the complex system approach to evaluation unearth changes in policy systems and environments on the path to equity? And so we kind of already know that we can link um, systems or like let's say health tied to a PSE change. We don't know if we can link the PSE change to um, changes in e equity or decreasing equity. Um, I think you can, primarily because equity is its own system, and if you're changing um, policies, you're going to change the conditions in which people live, which um, hopefully decreases inequity. Um, uh, the third question, I think is maybe the most important one, and it's probably the most abstract too, um, and it's one that kind of has to do with like my life trajectory. <laughs> and it's, uh, can complex system approaches to evaluation be made accessible to more evaluators? And it's not just evaluators, it's to, to everybody. And so I think if people had the opportunity to, to learn about complex systems and systems theory, they would be more likely to understand that things are not as they are as they appear. Um, and that that's a critical 
a way of thinking and it's a critical shift, a mindset shift away from impact to development um, and to acknowledging that, you know, uh, like, uh, not, uh, like I said, not everything is as it seems. So um, I think if we were able to make that kind of thinking available, not only to evaluators, but to, let's say, um, some scientists are doing this in K through 12 and teaching students um, with blocks. Um, and that uh, and systems th systems thinking with just a bunch of uh, colored blocks, and I think this is awesome, and so I hope that we can uh, um, spread that kind of thinking. And I think if we can, we would have a lot less angry people. <laughs> um, and I think our political um, uh, uh, nature of like infighting would decrease as well because not everyone would take to um, defense um, and try to really ask questions about what's behind the, uh, someone's motives or what's behind someone's behavior um, was is it about emotion is it about uh, connections to certain people so um, that's it and if you write down your email I will see I will send you the these slides that hopefully appear right on your computer um, and also a literature review of, of um, these types of concepts that's it. Any questions?